Greetings. The Lord is with you. It's good to join you tonight, and uh, we're going to be uh, tonight and tomorrow in the book of Galatians. On uh, Thursday, we start the book of James, and as always, I invite you to review the uh, Bible Project, Book of James. They're usually eight or nine minutes introduction into uh, one of the books of the Bible uh, for longer books like one of the Gospels or you know, one of the long prophets like Isaiah, they, they'll have more than one video, but but uh, um, I think this would be very helpful for us, and so I always recommend that. And tonight uh, we are going to do uh, Galatians 5. Yesterday we were in Galatians 4, and remember this is all about a hullabaloo, about, uh, and you, you don't see uh, uh, St. Paul being a any angrier anywhere. And then he is in the book of of Galatians, and uh, uh, we see that uh, um, especially true uh, tonight. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the, the the language has been graphic. Uh, it's going to be more graphic. Yesterday, um, he was comparing uh, that uh, what it means to to be made righteous before faith by uh, the promise God makes and trusting the promise of God and not by works of the law. And then he compared it in chapter four to being to Abraham's two sons. One was the son of the promise through Sarah uh, because he's trusting God would give him a child through Sarah. Uh, but one time before that, Sarah had suggested, nah, maybe God's not gonna come through with the promise. Why don't you have relations with my maid, uh, Hagar, and, and then through Hagar, that'll be my child. Um, and he thought, okay, and he did that. And uh, um, it was not what God wanted. God blessed and protected the child Ishmael, uh, but, but, the, but that was the child of works, not the child of faith. And, and the promise is through the child of faith. Uh, through not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. And he goes on to compare these two sons and to talk about there was one son of the slave woman and one son of the free woman. And we are the son uh, from the son of the promise, the son of the free woman, uh, Isaac, son of, of Sarah. And he ended up chapter four by saying, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. He's going to talk today about... Uh, about uh, being set free in Christ. And so that's our, our theme. Susie, uh, good evening to you. Uh, Katrina, everyone else on. We begin as we make the sign of the cross and say together we are under the care of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And let's have an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather together on this beautiful evening uh, to, uh, to hear your word and to understand the overwhelming blessings you have for us when we put our trust in you. This is a lifelong challenge, at least for me, a daily challenge for me. And I pray, Lord, that you would help as I read this text today, me and those who join with me, that we might be strengthened, challenged, to trust in you instead of ourselves and what that can mean for us. We ask, Lord, you open your word to us and that you open our hearts to receive that word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me. Uh, Ray, good evening to you and uh, uh, Charlotte. Oh, hi, Charlotte, uh, you and Stan. Uh, good evening to you and uh, uh, Katrina and Susie and Everyone else clicking on? Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Today and tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, we'll do Galatians in worship at, a, at 11 in the morning and 7 in the evening. I'll be teaching on it as part of the service. So, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Chapter 5, verse 1. Um, the reason we're children of the free woman is God doesn't want us to be enslaved to the law or anything, um, not to sin, not to death, not to the devil. He wants to set us free. But, but what does it mean to be free? Well, he's going to be tackling that issue today. 
For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Again, this is related to the, uh, the circumcision party, the Judaizers, that were trying to get the Galatian Christians to not trust only in Christ, but to trust in Christ and good works by following the law and by um, uh, getting circumcised. Paul said, no, you cannot be saved that way. He'll be very strong in his language today. I, I don't want to miss it. Let's so just get into his strong language. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept, accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. If Christ's death on the cross is not good enough, if he needs your help, then he's not a very good savior, is he? If, if God needs the help of Bob Quaintance, boy, God is in trouble. <laughs> but, but they aren't thinking clearly. And he's chided them or chastised them for that. If you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. A circumcision is a sign of becoming a Jew. And if you want to be a Jew, then you have to live as a Jew. And the law is for Jews. It's not for Gentiles. It's for God's people. But, but all of us are children of faith, children of Abraham, if, as we are children of, the, of faith. And by faith, we become heirs with Abraham. The law, if you want to be that, you can be a Jew. But... Um, if you're going to get circumcised, that's not the only thing you have to do. If you think you need to be circumcised and follow the law, then you have to follow the whole law. He who has accepts circumcision is obligated to keep the whole law. And then what happens? Verse 4, you, and you remember circumcision is cutting off a particular foreskin of, of a male. Um, well, if you're thinking about getting cuts on your body, that somehow that makes you acceptable to God. Here, verse 4. If you do that, you are severed from Christ. You are cut off from Christ. You want to make some cuts in your body? Hmm. You will be cut off from Christ. That's pretty strong language. Severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. We are saved only by by the incarnation, God coming to earth to save us, to, to be one of us, and then dying on the cross that, that, he can, that he can take us to heaven. He comes down, the incarnation and, and the um, <clears throat> death and resurrection of Christ, he, he makes us right with God. It's all his work, the coming to us, <clears throat> the dying and going to God and bringing us to God with him. And if you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. And if you've fallen away from grace, you've fallen away from forgiveness, from heaven, from the presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit. You've just cut yourself off from Christ. Good grief. For through the Spirit, there, there's not two options here. We are saved by grace alone, by Christ alone, through faith alone, by God's word alone. Oops, I'm knocking things off my desk here. For through the Spirit... By faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of, the, of righteousness. Um, we are already made righteous, as we heard in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, that he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. We are already made perfect, but we are in this life becoming what God has made us to be. And so we've already received righteousness, he has made us righteous by faith in Christ. And then we are in the process of becoming righteous. Through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. That one day, I will look like I wish I look. And I don't mean in, in, on the outside. But, but that one day, I will be the person that I desperately wish to be. Um, for in Christ Jesus... Verse, uh, verse 6, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, 
it doesn't matter if you're in Christ, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing if you are in Christ. But only faith working through love. What a, what a wonderful phrase. The only thing that matters is, first of all, faith. And faith that shows itself in acts of love. Our faith is not, therefore, just a, an intellectual. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. But it's a, a relationship with Christ that is uh, life-giving, life-changing. We become new creations, as we heard in last Sunday's second lesson. And, and so as a new creation, as Christ is living in us, what does Christ look like? He looks like love. And so we begin in this hope of righteousness, becoming more like Christ, that we become more loving, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourself. The only thing that matters isn't whether we're Jews or Gentiles, but whether we believe and whether we love. Only faith working through love. Verse 7, you were running well. Uh, when he started, when he preached to the Galatians and they came to faith, he said, you are running well. Oh, Heidi, I haven't, I haven't talked to you, in, spoken to you forever. Hi, Shirley and, and uh, Stacy. Um, and, oh, and Heidi, yeah. So, whoops, I think I, I lost some of my, let me get my, there we are, that's better. I'll stop hitting my screen. You were running well. You started off when I when I brought the gospel to you. You believed and you started off really well. Paul journeyed through Galatia, which was about the size of Ohio, walking around. And then when he was left for dead, uh, after being stoned, he got back up, went into that town, went to another, and then went right back around the towns that he had been to at first. Uh, he left them. He, he heard reports about them, and they started off well. But sometime after Paul was there, then those circumcision people came and the, the Judaizers and tried to present a perverted gospel, which is not the gospel, that you need Jesus and something else. Ugh. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The truth is, if Jesus isn't good enough, then he's not a savior. You'll have to save yourself. And that makes it like every other religion in the world hopeless. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. This is not from God. Then a, a phrase, a, kind of like a mini parable like Jesus might have told, a, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You don't need... My, uh, if it's just that Jesus is like 99% of, of the way to God, uh, faith in Jesus, but you do have to do one thing, get circumcised. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. If you have to start down the journey of works to please God, that somehow God's going to love you if you pray harder, attend church more frequently, if you can't understand that God loves you and wants to come and live in your heart and have a personal relationship, life-giving, meaningful, intimate relationship with you, and it's all going to be what he does and how he comes to you in his absolute grace, if you don't understand that, then um, the leaven's been working in your life and is drawing you away from God, which, which is absolutely what you know to be true because every time... You have to confess your sins. You know that you have fallen away from God. And if you're not confessing your sins, 1 John chapter 1 says, if we do not confess our sins, the truth is not it. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and make God a liar because <laughs> every person is a sinner. Now, uh, we don't need to deceive ourselves. We know the truth, um, that we are saved by grace. Don't go down any other road. And Paul now switches to a word, of hopefulness. Verse 10, I have confidence in the Lord. He didn't say, I have confidence in you. <laughs> no, he's pretty upset with them. And his confidence isn't in humans. He has no confidence in himself. He said, my confidence is in the Lord that you will take no other view. His confidence is that he's praying 
and he knows the power of the gospel. And there's no other power greater than the gospel message, that you are saved by grace, that your relationship with God is built, founded and built on grace alone. I have confidence in Jesus. He's holding on to you. And I trust that the good shepherd is going to lead you to, to quiet waters and, and green pastures, and you'll be just fine. I trust in the Lord that you will take no other view. I have confidence in the Lord. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. Uh, there is a day of judging for what we teach. And if someone's teaching falsehood, they will have to answer to the Lord for that. And, and it's a strong word, but I don't always get things said right. And I'm sure there'll be an accountability for that. I thank God that the accountability that I, that I know in the end, that I am only going to be saved, not by being correct and right all the time. <laughs> Isn't that a silly thought? But I'm going to be saved by grace alone, this poor sinner, um, the only way God does it. So I have confidence in him. And the one troubling you, he'll bear the penalty, whoever that is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, which he doesn't, why am I still being persecuted? This gives us a, a, a key to understanding one of the reasons the Judaizers or the circumcision party was coming around wasn't only because they believed that you really had to be uh, to be a real Christian, you had to follow the Jewish law because they'd been raised up as Jews and they just thought everybody had to be Jews. Um, they, they, that wasn't their sole reason. But because Christian, Christianity was a part of Judaism, they found that if they got Christian Gentile Christians to be circumcised, the Jews would leave them alone. Remember, as Paul went into Galatia, in every town he went in, as he made that journey through Galatia, that that eventually some of the Jews would rise up, some Jews would believe, and some Gentiles would believe. And then some Jews, looking at others leaving their fold and going to follow Christ, they get jealous and they would persecute Paul. They're the ones who stoned him in Lystra and left him thinking he was dead, and maybe he was, but whatever happened, God raised him up and he got right back and went right into the city that had just stoned him. Well, I, I, it's mind-boggling, but that was a story we already read in Acts. I won't go back there. But he's being persecuted because he's not making people become Jewish. And that is upsetting Jews. So he very so so it seems to be, a, as we study this, that some of the Jewish Christians thought it's a good idea to be Jewish because then you won't be persecuted. And so they wanted to be they wanted to protect themselves. Well, Paul would have none of that. Uh, he was constantly being persecuted because he wouldn't give in to that circumcision party. If I preach circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. The offense of the cross. Paul has much to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can read through that if you choose. The offense of the cross that is simply by the death of Jesus Christ, the substitutionary death in my place, substituted for me, it, by his death on the cross, um, he paid the death penalty for everyone alive. And he frees us from sin, death, and the power of the devil if we but trust in him. Um, and so, so he says... It, it, if I was to get circumcised so as I would make Christianity less offensive, well, then the offense of the cross would be removed. The cross wouldn't save me. And he knows, particularly in his own life, that it is the cross of Jesus Christ that is his only hope of salvation. We're going to have, in the second lesson this coming Sunday, we're going to have Paul's understanding of that as well. He said, he's so worked up about this. This next verse is unbelievable. It is extremely clear how worked up Paul is about this. Uh, remember, he's already said that, um, 
that if you accept circumcision, you are obligated to keep the whole law, and you are severed from Christ. Strong language. Here's another strong one. Verse 12, I wish those who unsettle you, those who are causing a problem among you, I wish that they would emasculate themselves. Not just cut off the foreskin, but the testicles. <laughs> oh, jeepers. I said it was graphic language. I wish they would emasculate themselves because they're trying to emasculate the cross and he will have none of it. St. Paul is for Jesus. And it doesn't matter if he's stoned, shipwrecked, beaten, imprisoned, killed. He will be for Jesus, period, and Christ alone. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, worth your time. Verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. So, so here's going to talk about well, what does it mean to be free in Christ? Only do you not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Freedom in Christ is freedom from the, the demand of the law and the powerlessness of the law to save you or to help you in your standing before God. The law can tell you what to do. It can't help you to do it. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Your freedom doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. No, whatever you want, Jesus said, come follow me. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. That's like what comes natural to you, Best not do that. Best do what the Spirit calls you to do. Going the way of what naturally comes your way is the way of the flesh. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, your sinful nature you were born with, but again, through love, serve one another. What matters? Only faith working through love. What matters? Only through love, what matters is use your freedom to love others, to love your neighbor, to serve one another, to serve your family, your fellow Christians, your neighbors, your co-workers. All of those are called neighbor. There's yourself and there's everyone else, your neighbor. Serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus. Jesus quoted that. But if you bite and devour one another, if you're fighting, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. This is not the path of Christ. The path of Christ is quite clear. Love. Love seen in service toward neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to talking about this works of the flesh, uh, instead of the works of law. The freedom is not the freedom to do whatever you want. We have that in this next section. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh, your old sinful nature, are against the Spirit. <laughs> they, they would drive you away from God. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. They're opposite poles. For those who are, for they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. You really want to serve Christ, but your flesh gets in the way. It happens all the time, happens every day. So don't live by what your flesh wants. That's down the wrong path, and we all do it. When we get angry, when we give in to bad habits, whatever it is, we follow our sinful nature. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, what I have to do. No, it becomes, what does loving God call me to do? What does loving my neighbor call me to do? Not, how do I gain God's favor by doing something? But since I've already been favored by God, how can I live in the light of his love by loving him and loving others? 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. If you want to look at the old sinful nature, what does the sinful nature do? Sexual immorality, impurity, which can be actions, but also in our mind. Sensuality, just um, our culture is a very sensual culture, uh, always trying to um, um, appeal to the old flesh uh, through advertising that is sexually oriented. Uh, idolatry, sorcery, um, worship other religions, trying to find some other way to God. Passed by a, um, a, a place this week on, on Route 224. I was looking that it said that you could have uh, a spiritual reading. I mean, well, that wasn't a Christian place. Um, uh, works of the flesh, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, and sorcery. And then relationally, enmity, uh, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. He's got all sorts of words for how we live together in community, in, in our families, at church, in our neighborhood, in society in general, when we're with other people. Uh, the works of the flesh are quite evident. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Um, then in our own personal lives, uh, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you. As I warned you before, like when he was with them preaching the gospel, I warned you. As I warned, I warned you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, those who are of the flesh will not be in heaven. Only those whose lives have been made new by the Spirit. That does not mean that evidence of the of the battle with the flesh isn't still there in our lives. It is. But if we're ruled by the Spirit, we we are trying to walk by the Spirit, make it our aim to walk by the Spirit, and not just giving in all the time to only our sexual pleasures or our, our sensual pleasures, our, our self-centered pleasures. But if we're living by the Spirit, not by the flesh, then something happens. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the works of the flesh, if we're doing, 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 this is where we'll do it. But if, if we're committed to Christ, and if Christ is in us and his Holy Spirit is at work in us, it will be like the fruit that's in the vine, the, the, the life that's in the vine will come into the branch and it will produce fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit, what will the fruit of a Christian life be? Love, joy, peace, patience. Uh, we, we were just looking at this verse in our confirmation class this last Sunday and, and talking about people that they knew, um, and sometimes in them. What does love look like? What, is, what does joy look like? What does peace look like or patience? And they could get pictures of it, of what wasn't patient and what was patient or how hard it is to love. Um, what does it mean to be joyful? What is it to experience peace? Well, these are the things God gives abundantly. And if they're things that you want, there's one place to get it in Christ alone, and giving your life to Christ, asking him to come and, 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 and come into your life for the first time, or like our Lenten theme, Psalm 51, create in me a new heart, O Lord, and put a right spirit within me. Just pray that prayer again, that God would come in and renew us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. <laughs> You're free to do these things. Not commanded, but free. Why? Because, again, the only thing that matters is faith, working through love, or as Paul said, but the thing that matters is love, serving one another, loving your neighbor as yourself. When God's in us, love will be evident. So will joy and peace in your life.
peace will reign. You won't be frantic and worried. Christ, and we don't need to try and not be worried. We just turn to Christ again and ask him to fill us with his presence, his spirit, so that we might have love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What do we need to do with the flesh? Try harder? <laughs> no, no, no. It won't ever work. No, we don't try harder. We just go back to Jesus, the only one who can save us. And he will. And Paul has confidence even that these people, that he who began a good work in them will, will be able to complete it. Um, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit is walking. Let's, let's walk with him. Let's walk with the Spirit, not with your own efforts to battle those demons inside or the works of the flesh or the old habits. No, just try and see where the Spirit is and trust him and walk that way. Last verse. Let us not become conceited provoking one another or envying one another. No, those are works of the flesh. Let's just love one another. Let's cling to Jesus. Uh, let's live by the Spirit and walk with the Spirit. And he will teach you how to live. He will help you to live. Tomorrow we look at chapter 6. Let's have a closing prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you, Lord, for how firm Paul is once again that it's only Jesus, Christ alone, by grace alone, by faith alone, and not by any works, that we are going to experience the life of God. Lord, I pray for each person here tonight that somehow, Lord, you would come into their life and rejuvenate them and help them, Lord, to, to find you. To, not, that they're, not that you're hiding, <laughs> but that you, as Lord, they turn to you, that as we call on you in the day of trouble, you will deliver us. Lord, you will come and give us your peace and your joy in the midst of whatever storms we're facing, that we might be gentle and good and kind. Lord, let our lives be lives of service to others, that your love might shine through. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, good to be with you tonight. And remember, uh, we'll be on at 7 in the morning on Facebook and in the evening on the church website or YouTube channel. Uh, and as I part, God bless you. Remember, God loves you, and so do I. Bye-bye.